Hello, I'm Paul Cartledge, A.G. Lavendi Senior Research Fellow of Clare College, Cambridge. I've been a member of the Hellenic Society almost 50 years, and so I've used the library on and off uh, many, many times, and it means a, a huge amount to me that it exists, that it should continue to exist. My most recent book is about a topic which, well, in a way, sadly, I feel sad at any rate, is exceptionally current. In other words, democracy. The word is Greek, demokratia. It's ancient Greek, and in ancient Greek it meant the power of the demos, and the demos were the masses, the majority of adult male citizens, most of whom were poor. Modern-day politics uh, uses the word democracy. We like to think we have a democracy. But our democracy is radically different from any ancient Greek democracy in one key respect. All modern democracies, if they're genuinely democratic, are representative. That is, we the people don't actually rule on a day-to-day -day basis. We choose others to rule for us, on our behalf, we hope, as well as instead of us. The ancients didn't see things that way. Partly for technological reasons, they ruled themselves directly, crudely, by mass meeting. So in all these ways, when we throw around the word democracy and we claim that it starts in ancient Greece, we're actually not right. There is a continuity, but it is a continuity of word, not of thing. Well, when I was writing my book, of course, as a historian, I'm absolutely dependent on sources, the nature of the ancient evidence. And I happen to be exceptionally fortunate in one regard, and this is not true just of democracy, but it's true of many, many aspects of what I've done for the last 50 years, which is study ancient Greece. And this is that one of my prime sources is Herodotus, Herodotus of Halicarnassus, which is now in Western Turkey, father of history, as Cicero called him, author of the longest surviving prose work in ancient Greek, and yet, goodness me, how on earth did he produce it? How on earth was it produced as a physical artifact? Most people probably heard Herodotus rather than read Herodotus. There weren't libraries, certainly no public libraries in Herodotus' day, which is the second half of the 5th century BC or BCE, and yet somehow a copy, a version of his work was preserved and preserved happily until the 3rd century BC when a major library, in fact one of the world's first major libraries, that of Alexandria, included his work amongst its holdings. And it's as a result ultimately of the Alexandrians through the Romans, then the Renaissance, the early modern period and right down to the 20th century with printing that we're able now to read Herodotus, read him, privately or publicly, in a library, in your personal library, all these possibilities, and of course now, online, by digital means. Go back a couple of hundred years, I happen to have here with me a early 18th century copy of a, an edition, total edition of Herodotus, done by a Dutch scholar. And in those days, they'd read a book like that. You have to go to a library. Very few people would own books. They wouldn't uh, just happily go to a bookshop and buy a copy of that. And they would read it in Greek and Latin, not in Dutch, not in English, French, but in whatever their uh, language was, it would not be the language they would typically read. It would still be Latin, the universal language. Well, that's all gone. Latin is still obviously terribly important, but it's not a language of universal scholarship. So typically, I'm English, I read Herodotus in English, and I'm exceptionally fortunate that a colleague of mine, a dear friend of mine, Tom Holland, with whom I collaborated just a few years ago, published an edition, a translation, of Herodotus's histories. And I'm just going to read you one small passage because it bears directly on my book on democracy and on Herodotus's own project. And the interesting thing is that uh, he sets this comment in the mouth 
of a non-Greek, a Persian. So you've got to allow for cross-cultural uh, interference. So there is a Persian debating with two other Persians, and the issue is what sort of regime, political regime, should the Persians ideally have? And this speaker is a very, very early Democrat, though he doesn't actually use the word democracy. So he says, rule by the majority bears that fairest of titles, equality before the law. Not only that, but it has this second quality. It gives rise to none of the actions which a monarch characteristically takes. In this equality before the law, those in office have their authority courtesy of a lottery, and they wield it in a way that is strictly accountable. Every policy decision must be referred to the commonality of the people. That is why I give it as my opinion that we should abolish the monarchy and foster the rule of the masses. Everything, after all, is contained within the multitude. Well, as a fervent Republican myself, I couldn't agree more. But um, that's not the point. point is... The library that we all love and cherish, those of us who have an interest in perpetuating understanding of the ancient world as a way of understanding ourselves better, must do absolutely everything we can, including financially, to maintain the existence of this remarkable institution. Thank you very much.